A blessed morning to all the administrators, faculty, students, and parents of the CEAP member schools all over the Philippines. I am Miguel Carlo Abadines, the, currently the Advocacy and Information Management Officer, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we proceed formally with our webinar, let us begin with an opening prayer as we remember that we are in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we want to thank you for another wonderful day you have given to us. Another day for us to enjoy your creation and enjoy the life you have gifted to us. Be with us here today as we learn more about matters related to COVID vaccines and vaccinations. Be with our speaker as he shares his time and knowledge with us. Grant him the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and may your words of consolation, hope, and encouragement be shared through him. Help us discern our steps forward. Lord, we continue to face difficult times as a country, and we know that many of us and our fellow brothers and sisters are struggling through this pandemic. But Lord, we continue to hold on in faith that with you, all things will be well according to your plan. Inspire us to move forward in hope and faith as we face this pandemic. Grant us the grace to have deep compassion for those who are most in need and to respond generously to their needs. For our frontliners um, and other frontline workers, protect them and keep them safe through this pandemic. Send forth your Holy Spirit and lead us towards the path you wish for us to take, a path of love, a path of hope, and the path of courage. Always remind us that we are the people of the resurrection. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning once again. For those who just tuned in with us, we welcome you to the first day and opening of the CEAP information campaign on COVID vaccination. We are live both on SEA Facebook page and the CEAP channel on YouTube. Feel free to continue sharing this to your fellow teachers, administrators, parents, relatives, colleagues, so that they can join in and listen. Many of us here might have already have heard about the apprehension amongst Filipinos when it comes to the vaccines, with only about 6 out of 10 wanting, not wanting to get vaccinated. In response to this, the CEAP decided to participate actively in helping raise awareness and allay fears with regards to this issue. To explain further the rationale for the CEAP information campaign on COVID vaccination, I would like to invite the Vice President of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Father Iking Balongag. Thank you very much, Carlo. Sister Maria Marisa Viri, RVM, President of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, members of the National Board, Mr. Jose Alan I. Arellano, Executive Director of CEAP, members of the National Secretariat, CEAP members, schools, colleges, and universities all over the country, friends of CEAP, greetings from Sani Dumaguete. Pope Francis, third encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, opens with a chapter titled, Dark Clouds Over a Closed World. Here, the Holy Father presents the condition of the contemporary era by vividly describing the distortions that are emerging in the world today. And these distortions do not, do not only appear like dark clouds hovering over the world, but are also causing the world to close its door on a sense of humanity, on truth, 
and on authentic fraternity and social friendship. Among the many distortions that are prevalent in the world, he mentions the following. Throw away world, insufficiently universal human rights, globalization and progress without a shared roadmap, absence of human dignity on the borders, illusion of communication, shameless aggression, information without wisdom, to name a few. These, sadly, are strongly influencing the way people view the world and the manner they live life. In the Philippines, many Filipinos view the world and live life according to the information they get from social media. It does not matter if the information is without wisdom, to borrow Pope Francis' words, or if the information is not verified. For as long as it comes from social media, it must be used, quoted, and shared. So we receive a lot of messages through Messenger or Facebook or Viber or email about how vaccines allegedly transport hydrogel or nanolipid particle and embed these in the human body, or how the Antichrist is using vaccination as a way of subtly changing people's perspectives because CEAP's Facebook page actually got a comment regarding this and Mr. Aureliano alerted us about how some people are reacting to vaccination or how these vaccines can do the process of genetic modification of humanity. And many of us surprisingly easily use, quote and share these informations. Even educators or teachers of Catholic schools, perhaps even Catholic schools administrators. And because the information has been used, quoted and shared, they are treated by many like dogmas or pronouncements from the magisterium of the church. No wonder doubt, fear, and apprehension of vaccination seems to be the prevailing sentiment among Filipinos. In fact, from surveys and studies, currently only a small percentage of Filipinos are willing to be vaccinated. A good number of the population is not keen on getting the vaccine. While it is good to have a critical stand on issues, it is better to verify data and information. The Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, consistent with the ideals of Catholic education, are uh, consistent with the ideals of Catholic education, should transform the logic of excellence into love for wisdom, passion for truth and commitment to service, caring for others, and forming minds and hearts from the Philippine Catholic School Standards Defining Characteristic 5. By this, we can say that it is the association's serious responsibility to help Catholic schools navigate through the times by unpacking those that are not clear so that the truth is brought to the light for everyone to see, appreciate, and embrace. Consequently, everyone manages to make enlightened decisions, live a meaningful existence, and give glory and honor to God. Concretely, to clarify concerns and issues hounding the responses identified to solve the health crises, our CEAP has organized a webinar series starting with VAC to Basics today. Next week, we shall have two more sessions. One session on the experiences of those who have already received the vaccine, both those with allergies and without allergies. And the third session, which is going to be next week still, is one that will prepare schools, hopefully, for a possible rollout of the vaccination program in the local levels. It is hoped that the webinar series will provide answers to common questions or clarifications to prevailing doubts that have been expressed by most Filipinos so that together 
we all can move forward and embrace life wonderfully. Have a wonderful day, CEAP. Remember, this is for all our schools that no Catholic school may be left behind. God bless us all. Thank you, Father E. King, for sharing your thoughts about this very important issue. Uh, before we begin the webinar, allow me to give all of you in our audience some reminders. First, as the talk is ongoing, we encourage you to post your questions or comments in the comment section of our Facebook and YouTube, and we will ask these questions or read the comments during the question and answer portion. So we will have a substantial uh, amount of time for the question and answer, no? so we will be entertaining many of the questions that will come in. Second, certificates. We get a lot of queries about certificates. Please be informed that you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of the evaluation form. The link has already been, uh, the link will be posted uh, as part of the caption of this video on YouTube and Facebook. But please note that the link will only go live at 11.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. today. So if you click it now, it's not going to open. So you have to watch the webinar first. Um, we encourage you to answer the evaluation form and you will receive the certificate of attendance within three to five days. Finally, please be reminded that this is a free webinar brought to you in partnership with Tech Factors. Again, we are giving to, this to you for free. But if you want to pay it forward, you may donate to our Kapatirang Kamagong Fund it is our fund for helping the poor and struggling CEAP mission schools because we believe that we heal as one. No? And so lastly, we encourage you to share this webinar again to your networks with the hashtags, hashtag say up cares, hashtags I love Catholic education. And so without further ado, let's go straight into our first webinar where our resource person will be discussing the basic information about vaccines and vaccinations. To serve as our main speaker this morning for our webinar entitled Back to Basics, the What's, the How's, and the Why's of COVID Vaccination is Father Nicanor Ostriaco Jr. of the Order of Preachers. Father Ostriaco is a molecular biologist who serves as a professor of biology at Providence College in Rhode Island. He garnered his doctorate in biology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and specializes in the biology of cancers, aging, healthcare ethics, and bioethics in the Catholic tradition. He is a visiting professor of bio biological sciences at the University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines and a fellow of the OCTA research team where he is involved in pandemic management for the Philippines. Many of us have probably heard of Father Ostriaco in the many interviews, articles in different Filipino TV channels and media outlets where he discusses different aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic as well as share his own research into developing a COVID vaccine. Again, we are truly blessed to have him join us today to enlighten us about the COVID vaccines and vaccination. Let us all warmly welcome Father Austria. Well, thank you so much uh, to the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines for the kind invitation to present this webinar. And so good morning to you in the Philippines. I'm actually speaking from the United States. Um, I tried to return home to the Philippines two weeks ago, but because of the lockdown, I will not be able to go home until the beginning of May, God willing. So um, this morning, I would like to speak to you about the COVID-19 vaccines as well as the vaccination, ongoing vaccination strategy for our beloved country. Our, my talk is going to be divided into four parts. I'm going to begin with uh, 
just a very short and brief update on the, the current status of the pandemic in our country. I will then move to vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. As part of my work with the USD COVAX team, we deployed an open access survey to measure vaccine hesitancy and to determine its roots. And I would like to share that information with you. I would then, the rest of the presentation is going to focus on increasing vaccine confidence, primarily in, in, in my particular, uh, with my particular team on deploying social media to help our Kababayans to understand the truth of the vaccine. And then what I will end the most of this lecture will be talking about educating the vaccine hesitant in the Philippines. What is the truth of the vaccines and what do we have to tell them so they can understand how it is a great good for them to go and receive the vaccines. So I'll begin with the pandemic in the Philippines. So this is the pandemic curve for the Philippines as of today, April 13th in the United States, which is yesterday for you. And this is a pandemic curve. So the pandemic curve, you will see the vertical axis is the number of cases. And then the horizontal axis is the date. And you can see it's been one year. Uh, if you remember in August, there was a first surge in August, especially in the NCR, which led to the MECQ being reintroduced at the beginning of August. And then we are currently in the second surge. And hopefully you can see that the second surge is dramatically larger than the first surge. And it's actually a lot more sharper. It was a lot more sudden and drastic, explosive than the first surge, precisely because this is a variant-driven surge, unlike the, the previous surge. Um, unfortunately, we are still at the uh, peak of the surge. You can see the surge has not yet begun to come down. And to be honest with you, I am frustrated with the national government at this time because I do not understand why we were moved from ECQ to MECQ and the NCR bubble, given the data that currently uh, the curve has not yet begun to drop. Now, if you look at the mobility trends, so one of the things that you can do to understand the pandemic in the NCR is to look at how people interact with each other. Because one of the things you must remember is that people, uh, people are food for the virus. So if you want the virus to grow, you have to give them more people. And so the reason why the lockdown works, the lockdown starves the virus, is because the lockdown prevents people from meeting each other. And so the virus is not able to find new sources of food. And so it eventually starves. And it takes about 14 days for the virus to starve. So you can see this is the mobility trends in Manila. And um, if you look here, this was March of last year when we went into lockdown for the first time. So you can see that the mobility, the, the movement of people in the capital drops down to minus 80. And we were in lockdown, if you remember, for about two to three months. And you can see that... Uh, after about June 1st, the mobility begins to go up. And then we enter the first surge in July. And you see this little dip here. This little dip is actually the two-week MECQ that we experienced in August. And then we started going up again. So the government starts to open the economy. You see two sharp drops. These are the two super typhoons that passed over Luzon. So you can see that and we can precisely date those two. And then these two sharp peaks, the first peak is Christmas Day and the second is New Year's Day. And you can see on Christmas Day and New Year's Day, the Filipinos stay at home. And so this is a wonderful graph to show how to show the movement of the Filipino people. And I focus primarily on the purple curve because the purple curve is the use of public transport. And so a lot of Filipinos use the bus, they use the MRT. So we, are, we, can, we can look at that. Now you can see what happens here. Uh, in the last month, the government starts to close down. So we start closing down and it, on April 1st, it's at minus 77%, which is very similar to the ECQ last year. But all of a sudden, you see this little chaos. You see how in the last week, the 
the lockdown has not been stable. We and the reason why we have it has not been stable is twofold. One is Unfortunately, the government uh, was mis- dis- did not organize the distribution of Ayuda to 4 million families in the NCR. So we had family members leaving their homes and spending time with each other for many hours waiting for the Ayuda. So you can see there is a spike in the purple line when the first day the Ayuda is distributed in the NCR. And the second, of course, is that we are struggling with the vaccination centers where the vaccination centers are crowded and are, have therefore become sites of super spreader events. So the ECQ for the last two weeks, people have been asking, why hasn't it been as good as it could be? Well, one of the reasons is because the mobility has not been as tight as the first lockdown that we went through a year ago. Now, the number one concern is hospitals. So this is the hospitalization trend in the NCR. So this is the most recent hospital data that we have. So I want you to notice, just look at this curve here. So this graph will tell you how many people are in our hospitals in the NCR. And you will notice that on March 15th, uh, there were about 4,000. 4,800. It goes, it's keeping going up because the surge is increasing. But around April 1st, for the last two weeks, it has been flat. There have been no significant increases in people in the hospital. Now you will say, but there are so many sick people. Why are the number of people in the hospitals not increasing? Well, tragically, what this shows you is that our hospitals are full. So in spite of the numbers, so the government will say that we have an occupant uh, healthcare capacity utilization of of 65%, which seems to see, it seems that we have many extra beds. It turns out that we do not have the, probably we, we are looking at this now, we do not have enough nurses to staff the bed. So even though the beds are available, we do not have enough frontliners to take care of our Filipino uh, kababayans who are uh, COVID positive, which is why we have uh, maximum, we are, our hospitals are now at maximum capacity. And unfortunately, our projections show that they will remain at capacity for at least another month. Uh, And so uh, part of my frustration is that the national government does not appear to appreciate what to do in light of the overwhelming uh, the crisis that we are facing in the hospitals in the capital. So now we're going to look at vaccine hesitancy. So vaccine hesitancy is about the number of people in the Philippines who are not sure about getting vaccines. So at the end of January, before the vaccines arrived, um, my research team at UST deployed uh, an open access survey on social media. We got 15,651 responses from all over the Philippines, all of the 17 uh, regions of the country. And we saw that um, 56% said that they were going to receive the vaccine. Now, this is a little higher than other surveys. And one reason for this is that we were not able to access the very poor and the very old because they do not have social media accounts. So what you're seeing here is a snapshot of Filipinos who are involved in social media. And so there is a skew, there is a bias in favor of those who um, are not poor and are not elderly. But we were able to identify the root causes of this hesitancy. So what the first thing that I want to point out is that vaccine hesitancy is not ideological. What I mean by that, in contrast to the United States, so here in the United States, we have vaccine hesitancy that is ideological. There are people who do not believe that any vaccines will work at all. Uh, Filipinos believe that vaccines will work because 80, more than 80% of them believe that vaccination will help them. Uh, to beat COVID. However, they have specific concerns about the vaccines. They're most concerned about fake vaccines, side effects, safety, efficacy, and they're worried that the vaccines were not tested properly. So they have very concrete concerns about the vaccines. 
We also uh, wanted to identify their preference for the brand. And even though half of the Filipinos that we uh, queried had no preference, a significant number wanted an American or a European brand. And very few were inclined to either the Chinese or the Russian vaccines. And I'm going to point out later that one of the reasons why Sinovac is uh, used in the Philippines is because there is an incredible shortage of the American and Western vaccines throughout the world. We also discovered that Filipinos are more concerned about their families than about themselves. So they are mostly concerned that someone in their family will get COVID. Now, this is in contrast to American surveys, which show that for Americans, so much of the concern is about the self rather than for the, for the family or for the community. Um, we wanted to look at the influence, the social influence of of our respondents and respondents wanted, they basically said that most wanted to wait till other people receive the vaccines and they wanted the politicians to receive the vaccine first, which is why after we, we published the survey, we actually wrote to the president to ask uh, the president, my students call him Lolo Duterte. We've asked Lolo Duterte to please get vaccinated on in public to show the people that these vaccines are actually free, uh, free from, from possible harm and they are low risk. Now, in response to that survey, uh, my team at UST, which we um, decided that we would begin an information program, an awareness program. We, we began this in January to do the following things. We wanted to provide the Filipino people with truthful information that would help them to allay their fears about safety and efficacy of the vaccines. We wanted to emphasize the need to protect not only yourself and your families, and we wanted to provide the Filipino people with personal testimony. Since, since the survey showed that Filipinos wanted to hear about other Filipinos receiving the vaccines, we started to provide testimonies on social media. So this is the USD COVAX response. This is my, my research team in at the University of Santo Tomas. We even have a logo of, um, of a Filipino weaver ant. It's an ant that is very painful when it bites you. And um, because my students wanted this to be the logo, uh, it's, uh, they wanted to highlight that the injection is like the bite of an ant, you know, uh, and so this is our this is our awareness campaign, and these are some of my students. Uh, they're mostly industrial biology majors at US3 in their third year. We also are blessed to have students from the Department of Advertising Arts from the College of Fine Arts and Design. They help us with our graphics, and we have recently. Um, we have recently been joined by students from medical biology because we have started to, to roll out uh, infographics on new therapeutics like ivermectin because there were so many questions on ivermectin that my students began to put infographics out on ivermectin. So what do we do? We make these infographics. So we make them in English. So this is an infographic about where the vaccines will come from. This in English, and we also do it in Filipino. And this is a infographic to describe the different vaccine platforms, which I will describe shortly, and what they do to help you to be vaccinated. And really most interestingly, we have been uh, collecting COVAX-19 testimonies that feature vaccinated Filipinos from around the world. So we, we found Filipinos all over the world who were vaccinated, and we asked them to send us a selfie and a quote in English and in their local language. So some of them are in Visayan, some of them are in Ilocano. So we, we are putting this all over social media to encourage our Kababayans in the Philippines to understand that other Filipinos are, have already been vaccinated elsewhere. Um, and this is our uh, COVAX Awareness Team Facebook page. And I'm inviting all of you to use our social media infographics to educate your students and your colleagues. And if you need a specific 
question in mind, you can send a message to my team and we will go ahead and put an infographic together that will address your question or the, the questions of that your students or your, uh, your faculty colleagues may have. And so we are doing this, we are deploying two or three infographics every week uh, on social media, and we are trying to increase the, um, the reach of our work. So the majority, the remainder of my talk now, my lecture is actually to tell you about the vaccines, to tell you the facts and the truths to help you to decide that the, and to realize that the vaccines are good and they're good for us. And in fact, they're necessary for us to end the pandemic. So I will begin with an overview of the COVID-19 vaccines. What are they? What do they do? So this is the virus tracker from the, uh, the New York Times here in the United States, updated from April 13th. So you'll notice we now have in the world, we have eight approved vaccines for full use. Five of them are emergency use authorization. Four of the vaccines were abandoned because they did not pass their trials. And so you have so many of these vaccines that are moving along the different trials. And, um, but we already have, by the grace of God, a substantial vaccine portfolio that will hopefully end, help us to end our, the, the pandemic around the world. Now, these are some of the leading vaccines you've heard. I'm sure you've heard of them, Pfizer and Moderna. So the ones that I'm going to focus in are the ones that will probably be used in the Philippines. So you have Pfizer and Moderna, and um, these two are currently being used in full force in the United States, which is why they will not become available for the Philippines until the, probably the third quarter of this year. We have Gamelaya and from the Russia, AstraZeneca from the United Kingdom, and then you have Sinovac uh, from China. So those are the major ones. We also have Johnson and Johnson, but that is a much smaller. It's a much smaller um, manufacturing capacity. So how do they work? So the thing that you have to understand, and the most basic thing I can tell you is that antibodies destroy SARS-CoV-2. So here you have a picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and these blue things are called antibodies and your body makes antibodies and they destroy anything that tries to invade the body. So the goal of the vaccine is to help your body make antibodies. And this is a famous picture. This is the first person to receive a vaccine against COVID-19. She is 91 years old. She received it in December in the United Kingdom. She's the first one to receive it outside a clinical trial. And people don't realize is the nurse who vaccinated her is a Filipina who has been in the United Kingdom for 20 years. So we want the vaccines help your body to make antibodies. And they do this because they deliver something. They take, so this is a picture of the virus, and you see the skin of the virus is covered with these red spikes. And what happens is the vaccines will deliver the spike to your immune system, to your body. And there are di the different vaccines will deliver the spike protein in different ways. So just like if you ordered a package from Lazada, you can have a delivery guy on a truck, on a uh, motorcycle, maybe even on a, a bicycle. There are many delivery systems that are delivering the same thing. So the different vaccines are delivering the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They are not delivering living virus. They're just a part of the virus. So for example, Pfizer and Moderna, this is the RNA vaccines. Uh, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson, they are called the viral vectors. Then you have uh, Gamelaya and, um, I'm sorry, not Gamelaya. This one, yes, Gamelaya and AstraZeneca are viral vectors. Sinopharm and Sinovac are the whole virus. This is the, they take the SARS-CoV-2 virus, they kill it, they inactivate it, and they inject the dead virus into you. And then you have protein subunit. We don't have any yet 
Uh, this is Novavax. It will arrive sometime this year. So there are going to be different delivery systems. They're going to deliver uh, the spike protein into your body. This is uh, what I thought I would do here is just uh, give you, so this is Sinovac. There's a um, G Sinovac and Gamalaya. There's a typo for some reason. So this is China, Russia, and the UK. These are the different, these are the important. So a lot of people are comparing the efficacy against, um, against COVID. The most important thing actually is that these vaccines protect you against severe disease and hospitalization. What does this mean? It doesn't matter if you get COVID-19, if COVID-19 simply gives you a cough. The reason why COVID-19 is dangerous is because COVID-19 can put you into the hospital. And these, va these vaccines will actually prevent you from getting severe COVID going to the hospital and dying. So even if you get COVID, if you are vaccinated, the COVID you will get is mild COVID. And this is why when I tell people, people ask me, which vaccine should I get? I should get, I tell them, the vaccine you should get is the one that is given to you because any protection is better than no protection. It's like buying a car. You are walking along the street and someone comes to you with a Toyota and says, do you want this car? You say, no, I want a BMW. Well, no, if you're walking, you want any car. Next year, you can get the BMW because it is likely we will have to be vaccinated every year against COVID to prevent the pandemic from coming back. So if you get AstraZeneca this year, if you get Sinovac, then next year when the viral supply is plentiful, then you can ask, oh, maybe I want a Pfizer. Maybe I want a Moderna. Okay. But right now to end the pandemic, my suggestion, my recommendation to you is whichever vaccine is available, you will take it because we, there is a shortage. You will see in a minute, there's a shortage. You cannot pick when there is a shortage of vaccines. Um, to give you a sense of, oh, again, another typo. This is 814 million. There's 814 million vaccine doses have been distributed as of this morning. So 814 million people have been vaccinated already, right? So the Philippines is, the total population of the Philippines is 110 million. So there are eight times the number of Filipinos in the world who have been vaccinated and they're vaccinating about 15 million people a day just to give you a sense uh, right now and that's expected to increase quite rapidly across the world so and um, in terms of risk right so side effects so this is me is a picture of me receiving the second dose of Moderna about a month ago I had no choice um, the, the, they said we only have Moderna I said sure now you will notice these are some of the side effects. It's painful in, this, in your arm. You are tired, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, fever, joint pain, chills, nausea, and swelling. Okay, let me tell you, I got nearly all of this. In fact, the, for one day after the second dose, I was so sick. I was shaking, I had muscle pain, I had fever, I had headache. Every joint in my body was painful, but it lasted one day and then it was finished. It is like a mini COVID for one day. And then it is done. So I'm telling you that when we get when you get vaccinated, now you notice the red lines are longer than the blue lines because the first dose is like the learning dose for your body. The second dose is the testing dose. So one of the things you need to know is that the side effects is a sign that the vaccine is working, which is why uh, the side effects are the more difficult the second dose because your immune system is already learned to recognize the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so it fights more against the vaccine. And you will, the, 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 the feeling of sickness is your body fighting the vaccine. And it will pass after 24 to 48 hours 
no more. You will feel better. And I'm telling you this. Now, it turns out the younger you are, the more difficult the immune system, the immune, the side effects. So in my convent, there were 40 priests, Dominican priests who were vaccinated on the same day. All the Lolo priests had no side effects. All of us who were younger, I, we were sick. And some of those who were very young were very sick because when you are older, when you are a senior citizen, your immune system is weaker. So the side effects is weaker. If your side effects are strong, it's because your immune system is, is strong. But this is just to tell you that don't worry if you get side effects. Now, there's a lot of talk now about blood clots with the AstraZeneca. Um, and I just want to share with you the risk, okay? So the risk of blood clots with AstraZeneca is one in 300,000. So that's about the risk. Now, the risk of being hit by lightning is one in 15,000. And the risk of being in a car crash is one in 103. This is just to give you a sense of the relative risk. The risk is very, very, very low. And even though it's really low, you can see that the regulatory agencies around the world are very cautious. Now, one of the, the challenges is that the risk of blood clots is increased is if a woman is on the birth control pill. So there are comments, there are concerns that because many of the people who get blood clots after the AstraZeneca vaccine are, are young women, actually. And so the concern actually is that the AstraZeneca vaccine is triggering a response in women, um, young women especially. And there has been a hypothesis that maybe it is because they're on the blood, the, the birth control pill. We do not know, but they, people are trying to figure out why this is the case. So just to tell you, uh, even though it's the risk is so low, what are some of the symptoms that you would feel if you had a blood clot? Uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, swelling in your leg, persistent pain in your stomach, severe persistent headache or blurred vision, and then tiny blood spots under the skin. So if these are any of the symptoms you have, if you had your vaccination, and if you have any of these, then these are uh signs that you should go to the emergency room to seek immediate attention just in case you are one of the rare people who has a complication from AstraZeneca. Now, there's also severe allergic reactions. You will see it is 10 out of 4 million people had allergic reactions. So again, the risk is very small, uh, 10, in four, uh, 10 in 4 million. And if you go to any of the vaccination centers in the Philippines, they have epinephrine. So if you get an allergic reaction, we will just give you an emergency injection of epinephrine and that will stop the reaction. And here in the United States, it's called an EpiPen. So this is what an EpiPen is. And there, I have students who are allergic to say peanut butter or to fish and they carry an EpiPen in their bag just in case they have a reaction. So I know in the Philippines, because I've been involved in uh, vaccine uh, preparation for some LGUs in the NCR, that the DOH has required that there will be this EpiPen mechanism available to every Filipino, which is why they will ask you to wait for 15 to 30 minutes after you get your injection, because if there is a reaction, it will happen between 15 to 30 minutes. So now let's talk about, do the vaccines work? So a lot of people are saying, do they work, Father? Let me talk about Israel. So this is Israel. And this is a graph that shows you the vaccinations in Israel. So let me just explain Israel. Israel has 9 million people. So Israel is smaller than the NCR. But what they did is they started vaccinating on December 20th. So by February 6th, 80% of their senior citizens were already fully vaccinated. And you can see they started vaccinating their first and second dose. So as of this month, actually in April, uh, they have vaccinated most of their people. 
So most of the people in Israel have been vaccinated. They have removed masks. There are no more masks in Israel. There are no more, there is now minimal social distancing. And this is the data they showed. So what they showed is that um, as they started to increase, the number of cases dropped. So senior citizens, there was a half, 50% drop in the number of cases. There was a num- drop in the number of people going to the hospitals. And there was a drop in the number of people who were getting sick. So you can, and this was in February. So this is not even before they vaccinated everybody. They noticed that their pandemic was dying. Across the board, the number of people got sick was down. The number of hospitalizations were down. The number of severe illness were down. And then when they compared the COVID uh, infections between Israelis who were vaccinated and Israelis who were not vaccinated, what they discovered is that the risk, the rate of getting sick was 166 per 10,000 people if you were not vaccinated and only six per 10,000 people. And this is also first dose and second dose. So what you're going to see is it's going to take a time. So you notice it takes about three weeks before the vaccine will have its full effect after the second dose, which is why it will take time. So if you read the newspaper about a Filipina in the United States who got her AstraZeneca and then five days later she got COVID, that's because it takes six weeks to be protected from the virus after your vaccine. It is not magic. It is not immediate. It takes time. So you can see that's happening in Israel. And like I said, they are they have stopped wearing masks. They have they have lifted all of their lockdown. Restaurants are open. People are traveling. Everyone is it's back to normal because of the vaccines. And our goal is to return to normal completely in the Philippines. So let's talk about the vaccines in the Philippines. First of all, you need to know that there is a vaccine shortage in the Philippines. So the global population is about 7.8 billion people in the whole world. We can only make about 5.6 billion um, vaccines for 5.6 billion people. What means that there are, there's a shortage of about 2 billion people. And the reason why this is the case is because most of the vaccines have been reserved or bought by five groups, the United States, Uh, the European Union, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. They have bought so many of the vaccines. For the rest of the world, there's only 800 million doses left for the rest of the world. This is not counting the Chinese, the Russian, and the Indian, which is why we in the Philippines have to get vaccines from these other countries. You see, people are saying, why don't we have Pfizer? Why don't we have Moderna? Because the United States has bought all of them up. So there is none left, which is why we must buy from all over the world. So we are, we are getting, our vaccine portfolio is extensive. It's from all over the, Philipp- all over the world. Now, this is from the, uh, this is a talk that I saw recently that uh, Senator, I mean, Secretary Galvez was giving. This is our rollout and vaccine delivery over the next year. We are now in the second quarter, so we are still waiting for. So our goal is that June to July, 2 million to 3 million per week is what we are going to try to vaccinate, right? So right now, as you can see, it's not been, it's been very small. We've only received 2.5 million. People are complaining, why do we have so few? We, it's not like we don't have the money. We don't, there's nothing to buy, right? There's just nothing to buy. Everything is gone already. So you have to wait until the Western countries complete their vaccination rollout and the United States will complete it by July 4th. Now, the highest vaccine priority categories for our country, A1 is frontline workers, A2 are senior citizens aged 60 years and above, and then persons with comorbidities, it is 14 million people. So what we see here is that this is the 
simultaneous vaccine administration. We are currently in the second quarter. So A1, A2, and A3 are being vaccinated. And we are, we, our hope is that by the end of the year, we will be vaccinating our Philippine, all the, our Filipino kababayans. Now, remember, it is likely that we will have to vaccinate every year, which is why we will do this every year for a long time. You see, this is people don't realize this is this is going to happen every year. So it's going to be very, very. It's going to be a challenge. So, I, I why should you get vaccinated, especially if you are young? Because because you have to protect not your not only yourself but those who are vulnerable around you. And we will need 70% of the population to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. So a lot of people say, what is herd immunity? This is herd immunity. So the red dots are sick COVID people and the blue dots are people who are not vaccinated. So when you have no vaccination, the red dots and the blue dots meet all the time. So the red dots will give the blue dots lots and lots of, of virus and people get sick. Notice what happens at 70% vaccination. At 70% vaccination, the blue dots are protected from the red because they are surrounded by yellow dots. So yellow dots are vaccinated people. Not everyone will be vaccinated. For example, children right now uh, are not authorized to be vaccinated. People who are uh, who have cancer, who are being treated with chemotherapy, sometimes they cannot be vaccinated. Those who are immunocompromised cannot be vaccinated. So there are groups of people for whom they cannot be vaccinated. And so what happens here, what happens here is we have herd immunity to protect them, which is why herd immunity prevents the virus from being transmitted. There are enormous challenges. It will be the largest and most complex public health effort in the history of our country, but it will benefit the poor and most vulnerable among us because they are the most at risk because they, their poverty makes their bodies vulnerable to illness and their poverty makes them live together in informal settlements, in slums where the virus can be transmitted more easily. So we have to target, we have to vaccinate basically 75 million people. Since there are 30 million young Filipinos, 16 years or younger, that means every single Filipino must be uh, targeted for vaccination in our entire country of 7,000 islands. We'll have to vaccinate most of them twice within a month. You can imagine how difficult this is. You have to go to Lolo and Lola and you say, Lolo, it's time for your second vaccination. And Lola will say, I was already vaccinated. No, you have to go for your second shot. This will be a challenge. And we have vaccine hesitancy. But uh, in my conclusions, first of all, uh, we have to thank God for the vaccines because uh, he gave them to us so soon after the beginning of the global pandemic. And we should all be vaccinated, not only to protect ourselves, but also to protect our neighbors, our families, especially those who are elderly and vulnerable. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, I'm open now for questions from the floor. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in school closures all across the globe. But even in these uncertain times, education must continue. And Rodrigo Duterte says he won't allow Are students to go back to school. Are we ready for a one-sided operating? We have a plan. He's talking about the shift in distance learning. Through this method, teachers deliver lessons outside the traditional classroom setup. As a leading provider of e-learning materials in the country, Tech Factors Incorporated 
is committed in helping you and your students experience positive teaching and learning environment inside or even outside the physical classroom. The step in you, we will not anymore have to face to face classes with our students. We ask Tech Factor if we can uh, convert to Tech Teach. And I'm happy because they agreed no, to that proposal. So um, we have scheduled uh, trainings already for our teachers. The way Tech Factors are handling their schools and the teachers is very accommodating and very commendable because they are there from time to time whenever we need guidance and help in terms of the LMS, in terms of the content. Congratulations for coming up with very good, effective, relevant, and useful learning materials. Tech Factors is continuously finding ways to adopt and to adjust in this new normal. I am convinced that being partners with TFI is a big help in this time of new normal. Tech Factors Incorporated, making learning a great experience. For more information, visit us at www.techfactors.com. And we are back. Good morning again to everyone who, is, who are listening live on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Let's give a virtual palakpak po no, kay Father Ostriaco for that really wonderful presentation. That was really amazing. And I'm sure many of us no, have learned a lot of things just listening in and, and really getting clear information about vaccines and vaccinations. No? But um, we, we're now re presently in our question and answer period and there are a lot of questions we're seeing in the comments. Uh, we'll go through them. We actually have quite a substantial amount of time. No? Uh, so major pending, uh, we can really go into these questions. But again, before we proceed, may I just remind you again that you will receive the certificate of attendance only upon completion of the evaluation form. No? So you may already see the link in the comment section or it will come in maybe in a few more minutes um, on our page, uh, on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. No? So again, the link will only go live once the webinar is, is finished no? or, or maybe just before the end of the webinar. Um, and it will only be open until 5 p.m. today. So if you want to be, get a certificate, you have to finish and um, basically fill it up by 5 p.m. No? So again, we, we encourage you to answer uh, the evaluation form. No? Um, so I guess that opens up our question and answer period. But before I, I, I go into that, I, I think there's a lot of greetings. Father, there's a lot of people watching us, about 2,000 people who are live. No? Um, and this covers from school administrators, uh, teachers, even some students. No? So maybe I'll just give some special greetings, especially to the board members who are wa watching. Sila Dr. Flores, of course, to sila Father E. King, the other members of the CF National Office also. Um, we have members even from, uh, we have a nurse, for example, from the Philippine General Hospital who are at the, the war zone, right, of, of this whole thing, right? So it's great to hear. Thank no? you so very I, much. Yes, thank you very much for all the work that you're doing, no, Ms. Mervyn Perez. Uh, what's interesting also, Father, is that we even have a student council joining us. No, So this comes from the Dominican uh, School of Manila. No, So we actually, <laughs> we, we actually, we actually saw them... Um, 
reposting a lot of the information campaign materials of CAAP. So they're here with us and they even made their own infographics to promote this. No? So it's great to have the students here. No? Uh, very encouraging no? to have the young people join us. And of course, the many other uh, people who's greeting us from the different schools across the country. No? Um, maybe just to open no? this, this question and answer, I, I think... Uh, the biggest question right now for people is that there is now more knowledge about variants, right? That the variants are here in the Philippines and it looks like the variants are the ones that are spreading quickly, uh, especially in the national capital region, as you mentioned. No? Um, people are asking, what, what, are, what is the efficacy then of, of the vaccines? Will the vaccines still be useful um, in this context, considering that, that the virus is evolving no, in the new variants? So maybe you can share some knowledge on that. So thank you for that question. Um, let me just begin by trying to give you a quick answer to what is a variant. So if you remember, the virus skin is covered with these red spike proteins, and there's about 75 of them. A variant is a uh, virus that changes the shape of that spike protein. And that spike protein is the key that the virus uses to enter your cells. So if the shape of that spike protein is better, then the virus can enter your cells better, which is why they transmit more. And which is why these variants are more transmissible. So that's the first question. The second question is, uh, how about the efficacy? It turns out that it depends upon which variant. So the B117 variant or the United Kingdom variant variant is actually as equally um, susceptible to the vaccines as the original variants, the original ancestral strain. The concern is actually for the two, the Brazilian variant and the South African variant. Now the Brazilian variant, the P1 variant, has, not, has been detected in the Philippines, but only one person has had that. And we think that the government was able to contain the spread of that particular variant. The concern is the South African variant, the P1351 variant from South Africa. We knew already that this variant is called an escape variant. It can escape your antibodies. It can escape your immune system. So it turns out it depends upon the vaccine. So surprisingly, Sinovac, there was a paper published a few days ago from Brazil. It looks like Sinovac is relatively resistant to the variants compared to the other Western vaccines. Now, the reason for this is Sinovac, if you remember, it takes the whole virus and injects the whole virus in you. So a variant is like the original strain most of the time, except for those spikes. So if you inject the entire virus, then your antibodies will detect the, the, the whole virus. And so even if the variant changes a little spike, it is still able to be destroyed by the antibodies. For Moderna, for Pfizer, for AstraZeneca, uh, they only deliver that spike protein. So if that spike protein changes enough, then the antibodies that are made against that little spike protein become ineffective. And so we are seeing that. We are seeing that, uh, that the efficacy is dropping, which is why more likely than not, we will have to receive a third booster shot of the vaccines down the road. So in fact, I, I told you I, to I took Moderna. We've already been told that probably around October, I will have to be vaccinated again against the variants. And um, Sir Carlo was telling you that we, my students and I here in the United States and at USD are making a vaccine for COVID-19 for the Filipinos, for the Filipino people. And we actually had to start making two vaccines, a vaccine against the original. And now we are also developing a vaccine against the variants because we will have to combine both of them. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Father. So, um, Maybe one of the things that I'm I'm wondering about um are we expecting more variants I guess no in a sense there's there seems within just one year we already saw a number of variants come out um and the second I guess is maybe you have some comments also on the Philippine variant I think it's appeared on some media sites I, I, and but not much has been said clearly about it yeah so uh, variants will appear when the pandemic is out of control. So let me explain. Variants, every COVID positive person makes his own variant. 
So every patient has his own variant, but most of these variants uh, cannot escape that patient. Uh, when the patient recovers, those variants die. But when, that, when you have a pandemic that is out of control, like we have in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, and in South Africa, what happens is there are so many people who get sick that some of the personal variants are able to escape the individual. So our hope is that as we vaccinate more people and we drive the number of sick people down, the rate of variants will decrease. Now you will notice we do not have variants, a lot of var talk about variants for the first six months of the pandemic. The variants only appeared around November and December. That was because the Western countries lost control of their, of their pandemics. And all of a sudden, there was chaos. Now, the Philippines, there is the so-called Philippine P3 variant, also called Central Visayan. But I have friends from Cebu who do not want to call it. They, they said it should be called the Filipino or Pinoy variant, not the Central Visayan variant. Anyway, it's not technical number is called P3. Um, it was identified at the Philippine Genome Center in Manila um, because they identified it in Filipinos who had COVID-19. We do not know if this variant is more transmissible. We do not know. It has some hallmarks of other variants that are known to be more transmissible but no one has done the formal study yet. And I'm still waiting for the data from Metro Manila to see if that variant has spread rapidly in the NCR. The difficulty is that there are three variants that are um, growing in the NCR. So it's hard to decide which one is driving the pandemic. There's the UK variant, the South African variant, and then the Pinoy variant. So you have these three variants that are, that are going uh, that they're, they've, been, they've been identified, we do not know which one is really driving the, pen, the surge. Yeah, um, I, I think there's, there's also, I guess, by, by, by what you've mentioned, uh, as variants do come out more when, when things go out of control. And I guess that's why there's such a huge pressure on everyone actually worldwide to control the pandemic in whatever ways, right? And, and I guess that's also why we're also here no? to, to get people to, to vaccinate because... That, that's part no, of, of driving that's part. Down the, Once you're vaccinated, yes. the virus cannot use you to make variants, right? Uh, and so because the virus needs people to make variants of itself. So when we, when we vaccinate, we prevent variants from growing. Correct. Um, there's one question here about uh, from, from Sir Burdon. He's asking, how many times in a year can our body be safely vaccinated? So in that sense, for example, if you took Sinovac maybe and the two doses, does that mean that you can also take, I don't know, uh, I guess people have a preference for Pfizer. <laughs> and if it comes out at the end of the year, do I get Pfizer also after get maybe a Sinovac? So, or... so we know now that two weeks after the second dose, your immune system is nearly maxed out. So you have a glass of water and it's nearly full. You can keep pouring water but it, it's never going to get more full than it is already, right? So, so if people are so scared that they want to go get vaccinated every month, uh, we don't get vaccinated every month, right? Because we, we know that once your immune system has been fully charged, then we should not get... First of all, there's a shortage of vaccines. So we want everyone to be vaccinated. So instead of getting vaccinated a third time, you should just let someone else get vaccinated. Now there's a debate now about mixing brands. There is no study that shows you can mix brands. No, I do not know of any country in the world that has approved mixing brands. So if you get Sinovac for the first dose, you should get Sinovac for the second dose. If you get Pfizer or you get AstraZeneca, you have to get the second one. So um, now, do we expect there to be different? No, but there is no science to back it up. So we have to follow the data. We have to do what the science tells us to do. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a bit connected to that. Um, what happens if you, in a sense, because of the supply problems that we're facing in the Philippines, what if you, or maybe 
other delays. What if you miss the period that you're supposed to take your second dose? Uh, for example, if you're supposed to take it within three weeks, but instead you got it uh, five weeks, maybe. Uh, does that affect actually the... the so it turns out like with AstraZeneca, the United Kingdom, they extended it from two weeks to three months. And it turned out that the efficacy increased. It is better to wait longer between the doses. The same thing looks like for Sinovac. So it looks like in Sinovac, if you wait two weeks, it's something like 50%. If you wait three weeks, it goes up to 75, 80%. So, so I do not think that we, first of all, um, if there is a shortage, you will, you will not lose your protection if it is delayed. Okay. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, you should still get the second shot, right? Because you want maximum protection. And so, and it might, even if it goes for AstraZeneca, even if it goes after three months delay, it still seems to work. In fact, it seems to be better. So I, I want to reassure the Filipino who are watching that do not be scared if there is a delay, um, if there is no delay, then you should go and receive it when it is your turn. But if there is a delay, don't worry. Um, your body will not lose the protection and it might even improve. All right. Okay. That's great. That's really reassuring. No? <laughs> Considering the logistical problems we sometimes face in the bureaucracy uh, issue. So um, maybe I'll just jump straight from the vaccine impact, I guess, to the vaccine safety father. And maybe these are just some questions that people are asking. Um, the, the first one, I guess, is that there is really things being shared on Viber, on Facebook, groups about genetic modification, right? Do vaccines um, genetically modify, uh, I don't know, our DFA? Is, is that something that can happen, especially with, I guess, the new technologies uh, in, in Pfizer? So there is no evidence that the mRNA vaccines can permanently alter your DNA. In fact, if you understand what these mRNA vaccines are doing, you will see that they are trying to copy what the virus normally does. So the virus carries RNA, and then the virus injects its RNA into you. And then the RNA makes spike protein in you, and then the virus will make more copies of itself. So the vaccine is doing the same thing. Now, we do not say that the virus changes, genetically modifies you. And if the virus does not mo genetically modify you, then we do not expect that the vaccine will genetically modify you. In fact, we know that because these cells that uh, are making viral protein, the body will recognize them as infected and kill them. So any cells that are containing parts, you know, that were activated by the virus, to the best of our knowledge, they will eventually be killed within a day or two, which is why the side effects last only one or two days. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Father. Um, maybe this is just a series of questions related for those who take um, maintenance medicine. So a number of questions came in. Are the vaccines safe for those who have maintenance medicines, um, maybe who take blood thinners? And maybe even those who take antipsychotic drugs like Depakote and Abdin. Oh, is that so, something that will be problematic? Yeah. So I will first uh, advise the listeners to speak to their physicians, right? I, and then I point out that here in this country, there are no contraindications against vaccination except for allergies to the ingredients of the vaccine. Right. So and of course, age. So if you are 16 or below, you are you cannot receive the vaccine. But there are no non there are no known contraindicated conditions. So I and when people say, what about maintenance medicine? You speak to your doctor. More likely than not, your doctor will say, just keep, keep the maintenance medicine until the day of vaccination. Now, the thing that the CDC or the, here in the United States will say, though, is you should not be taking paracetamol the day before your vaccine. You should only be taking maintenance medicine, no extra medicine the day before, because you do not want to suppress your immune system just before it receives the vaccine. 
All right. So I guess at the end of the day, because there's so many different conditions, it would be good to go back, no, to to our Talk old to family doctor. doctors. Yeah. Yes, talk to our doctors. All right. Um, how about for those, in a sense, with um, uh, for this case, no, uh, two of them actually shared about someone who went through uh cancer, um, maybe a long time ago, no. So is vaccination recommended for me who had mastectomy eight years ago? Uh, cancer of the breast in almost stage one and for my twin sister who also had mastectomy last February stage two so that's the first one and then I guess those who actually are who are undergoing uh, chemotherapy is that something that would be an option for them so those there are, those are two separate questions for those who have yeah. survived cancer who are now cancer free especially those who are cancer free for for five years you are considered recovered and cured so you are the same risk as anyone else. So nonetheless, you should speak to your oncologist to make sure to reassure you. For those who are in chemotherapy, it's a different story. It depends on which chemotherapy they're on. It depends upon the health of their immune system. That must be discussed with the oncologist. All right. Okay. So again, go back to your uh, doctor. Um, in the same sense, um, vaccination on people with lupus, autoimmune, is that the same case yeah, as well? So, go back. so again, that is a hyper uh, immune response. Um, there is no indication that I know of in this country, in the United States, that contraindicates uh, for COVID-19 vaccination. But again, uh, the answer should be go to your doctor. Now, the, the challenge is most doctors in the Philippines will say, I don't know either. <laughs> and this is where you have to go to the FDA, right? So the FDA has to has to list the contraindications. And I believe in the emergency use authorization from the FDA, there are no known contraindicated conditions, just like here, except for allergies to the vaccine. All right. Thank you. Um Maybe I we, maybe this is something to emphasize again. You mentioned this again uh, about the safety of AstraZeneca, but I guess there are really people who are worried about it because countries decided to stop it, right? Like there are news about country. How do we how do we process that? I guess, uh, yeah. Well, you know, they stopped it to investigate it, right? So Germany stopped it, and then they reauthorized it after one week, right? So so. So they stopped it just to pause. If they didn't really stop, they paused. This is why it was important for me to show you the numbers. Yeah. Right. It's one in 300,000. It's particularly for young women. So if you are a senior citizen, it is unlikely that AstraZeneca poses any risk to you with regards to clots. So, so and again, if you compare the risk of getting COVID-19, especially now with an out of control surge, in the Philippines, right? And I, I, tragically, we are hearing of people who are dying uh, at higher rates and higher numbers. And I've heard stories of people dying in their car waiting for, a being, for admission to the hospital, which is tragic, right? It's tragic that our Kababayans are dying outside the hospital in their cars. Uh, this is not the way it's supposed to be in a develop. This is what it means to say your healthcare system is collapsing when people are dying in the uh, in the streets. But but having said that, um, the risk is much greater that you will be you will have severe COVID than you will have with clots. So again, with the car, right? So I say there is a one in one hundred chance you will be involved in a car accident. How many people will not use cars anymore? They will say, no, I need to go to the supermarket. So they will balance risk. And so you have to balance the risk. One in 300,000 of a blood clot, or you will get COVID. And the chance, especially if you're elderly, the chances of you getting severe COVID are much higher, like one in 10. So you see how it's a matter of comparing risk. Um, and I, I guess re related to, to, to that, no, the risk, um, maybe you have some tips, no? How do we encourage majority of people, I guess, to take the vaccine that is available now, no? That suffices for protection. Because I, I guess it's really the waiting period. People are really just waiting. And You will and not, if I tell you, I'll tell you this. <laughs> if you're waiting for Pfizer, Moderna, voila, you will not get it. It's not going to come, okay? So, because I know people think, I will wait till Pfizer, Moderna, it's not coming. 
It's not coming. It will come maybe next year. So now you have, you will have to wait eight months in the middle of a pandemic. So wait, wait, get the vaccine now and then get the Pfizer and Moderna next year. It's not like this is a one-time thing. You're going to do this every year for the rest of your life. So, you know, if you want to invest in Pfizer, Moderna, get it next year and the year after that, the year after that. But for now, to end our pandemic, we need to get the first available shot. Now, here in the United States, we only had two, Pfizer or Moderna. We now have Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson has temporarily been paused as of this morning, also for blood clots. So, you know, it's again, it's a very, uh, it's a, you, have to, you have to measure risk and you have to understand how, how we, this is not a one-time deal. So um, the risk of waiting is much greater than the risk of getting it, of getting it once you're vaccinated. Uh, and again, it goes back. <laughs> if there is something available, it's right there for us, and it will it's give right us protection. Right there in front of you. Get it. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I think one of the tensions, no, I, and I understand, Father, you've been involved in some conversations within the IATF. You're also in constant conversation with with the government. I think what what confuses a majority of us, especially here, no, <laughs> in NCR, is we, we don't. There's really this tension about economy. And health, right? Like the health system gets overwhelmed. That's why we have to lock down. But also when you lock down, there are people who will struggle with their day-to-day -day living. Maybe you have some thoughts and comments about this to, to enlighten us. So I will, I will say this first. I am not an economist, but I have been involved with talking to so many economists. I have some understanding of the economy. So the first thing is that all the data suggests that the best way to reopen the economy is to end the pandemic. So the fastest way to recover the economy is to end the pandemic. Why is this? First of all, people do not go out to the mall. If they are scared, they will get sick. I know many people now in the NCR, I, I've heard from my friends and my family, they just do not want to go out. Uh, and they, 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 their perception is that the government has lost control of the pandemic in the NCR. It, it's making no sense. The second thing is that um, elsewhere in the world, the governments of the world are borrowing to provide ayuda to their people. And one of the particular challenges when I speak to economists in the Philippines is they do not understand why the Filipino government is not providing more ayuda when our uh, debt to GDP ratio is only 55%. You know, Singapore is 113%. Malaysia, it's 68%. So, so the debt, we, we are conservative in our borrowing. And, and, and the idea is that this is a worldwide crisis. If we're not going to borrow now, when are we going to borrow? This is the time to borrow money to help our poor, not just our poor, but to help our business sector who are struggling. You know, here in the United States, every single American received $1,400 from the government. And this is the third check. This is the third check. I just got mine yesterday. I gave it to my community. It all goes to the community. But you see that the government is so um, stingy. This is not the time to be stingy. So we should, the, the, the strategy should be we lock down for as long as necessary to destroy and starve the virus. And then we provide all the ayuda that is necessary so that our kababayans do not starve, right? Because right now, we are, you, the, the choice appears to be you starve the virus or you starve the Filipino. You can choose to have the starving of the virus without starving the Filipino. It's a matter of providing ayuda and sufficient ayuda for the next month or two in order to help them. And if it means we must borrow more because there is an incredible crisis, health, then we should borrow. 
that that is my view as a non-economist who just spend time talking to economists. I know many economists, some in the government, who are trying to say this is the time to borrow now. All right. So it's really not a dichotomy, right? It, it's really how do you expand your view when understanding the health system and the economy? Um, I, I guess one of the this might be related to. Um, I guess for us in the educational sector, we've been struggling. I guess you've already heard that students are struggling with, with online classes. It's becoming difficult. No? Um, we want to understand, what's your take on having limited face-to-face -face classes no? uh, in the midst of, of, of what's happening right now in the Philippines, especially maybe for at least for some specific courses? What do you think about that? Well, um, this is not the, the middle of a second surge, tragically, is not the time for us to return to face-to-face -to -face in the NCR. I could imagine that there are places, low-risk regions of the Philippines where we could begin to open up. Now, there are many countries around the world that have been able to open up for some face-to-face. -face. So here in the United States, some school districts, you go to school once a week face-to-face -face or twice a week. So what they do is they divide the class the class into small groups. You have the Monday group, the Tuesday group, the Wednesday group, so they can socially distance. They can mask completely. Everything is small, but they give the students a chance to uh, go out. Now, we have a unique challenge in the Philippines. The, the, the unique challenge is we have intergenerational homes. So here in the United States and in throughout Europe, most of our, their senior citizens live separately from their families. Uh, the challenge in the Philippines is that our children may not get sick, but they may bring the virus home and get Lolo and Lola sick, and Lolo and Lola will die. So one of the challenges we are facing is if, as we try to reopen our schools, which is a necessary for the well-being of our, our children, uh, what do we do? And so my, what I, people, when people ask me, I say, once our seniors are vaccinated, so probably by the middle of this year, so maybe by next fall, the first sem of next year, once our senior citizens are vaccinated and protected, we should consider opening up our schools to a limited basis, allowing for face-to-face -face instruction on a temporary, uh, on a part-time basis. Right. So you, you divide your like I said, you divide the class into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The re and then so once a week you go to school. So that's and there are um, best practices throughout the world to help schools to to allow schools to reenter into this face to face in instruction, minimizing risk for our children. Yeah. Um, and I think for that also, I guess it will be nuanced across the Philippines. In a sense, we have different rates of uh, some areas are really safe. Uh, NCR is really like NCR questionable. is different. You know, NCR and Air Plus <laughs> is totally different. But you can imagine, you know, some of the islands in the Babuyana, Babuyanes Islands or yeah. the islands of, of, of the central Visayas where it's been minimal. We can reopen that, especially if our seniors are vaccinated. Right. Um, these are just some clarification. I, I'm sure you've seen it, Father, about the whole ivermectin. ivermectin. Yes, and, and it's a lot of things that are going about. Well, what's your take on it? Because I think there are even politicians who are endorsing it, right? It's just becoming problematic. So, 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 so here's the thing, right? There are many, many people will say if you eat shrimp, it will save you from COVID. So they're <laughs> all over the world. People are saying you can eat many, many things. So I have to say, we have to wait to the science. Yeah. And there are no clear clinical trials that show that ivermectin is, is effective. When you do show some effectiveness, the dosage of ivermectin is near toxic levels. So the danger, so, there, so you see, when, you are, when it has an effect and the effect is small, it becomes poisonous. And so the danger is that in the, the Filipino is going to go out and get ivermectin. Now, ivermectin is also prescribed for animals. 
and the and the formulation for veterinary ivermectin is not for people. So the danger is that Filipinos will now go out and get ivermectin and they will consume it and they will be poisoned by ivermectin. You see, so, so yeah. ivermectin is a poison. So talk about risk, right? We talk about risk. Are you going to take a poison when there's no clear scientific data that it helps? Yeah. Okay, so... Remember, uh, for those who are listening, ivermectin, it's, it's, it's toxic. <laughs> um, don't toxic. put it in your... Wait, let's wait for the data first. Yes, let's wait for the data and clarifications. No? Um, there's a significant number of questions here, Father, who, who want to know more about the vaccine that you are actually developing using yeast technology. Maybe you can, you can spend some time just talking about that and, and its progress. So, um, yeah. So I am a yeast molecular biologist. I've spent the 25 years of my life as a scientist, as a yeast molecular biologist. What this means is that I study yeast cells in order to understand cancer and Parkinson's disease. So that's my area of specialty. And we are, until the pandemic, we were looking for new chemotherapeutic drugs to uh, against particular forms of cancer, especially cancer of the kidney. Uh, once the pandemic happened, my lab had to shut down during lockdown. So uh, and I was locked down in the Philippines. And I happened to read a paper in Divine Providence about how yeast has been used to deliver drugs to the, to the, to the intestine. And so I said, why not use yeast to de deliver a vaccine to the gut? So that's what we are building now. We've actually built it. We are testing it now. We, are, we took a human probiotic yeast, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii. It is already approved for human consumption. In fact, um, the empty virus, the empty yeast is available even in Watson's, but it has no effect because we have to add the package. So we added to the yeast, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And so what we would like to do is we would like to make a oral pill. So you will, you will take um, Saccharomyces boulardii oral pill. You take a pill and the pill will introduce the vaccine into your stomach and your body will develop an immune response. This is our hope and our prayer. Um, I have spoken to the Lord and especially to Mama Mary about this. I said, look, I will do the best science I can do, but this has to be the Father's will. So it depends on what the Lord wants. Um, I hope to return to the Philippines on the 7th of May with this vaccine candidate. And you can see in the list of candidates, there are many vaccine candidates. Some have failed, some are successful. Uh, we would like to test it at the University of Santo Tomas and animals first. And if it passes the animal trials, then we will set up clinical trials for the vaccine in the Philippines. Amazing. Well, that's really exciting. And understandably, the logistics of this will be much more, e which much more easily done no? compared to actually getting injections and shots. So, correct? so it's, a, it's a shelf stable. It will last uh, at room temperature for two years. So what you can imagine is you have a bottle and you send a bottle of the vaccine to the Kalayan or Kamigin Island and they can hold it there with no refrigerator because they don't have constant uh, electric supply. And that's what I'm thinking about. How do we bring a vaccine to our more remote islands of our beloved country where they do not have constant electricity? They do not have a... So this is the, the hope. The hope is that... And it will be relatively cheap because all you have to do is it's like the yeast that you make, you know, pandesal with. So we would go to one of the yeast making factories in Laguna and, and I will tell them, <laughs> uh, can I remove the yeast from your manufacturing system? And for one day, you just make our yeast and then you make huge chunks of it. And it's very cheap diba? because it's yeast. So how many pesos is this sachet of yeast? So that would be equivalent and you could keep it. So this, this, and I am doing this for the poor. You see, I got so frustrated because um, I, when I was home at UST, I would pray my rosary and walk around the campus. And I met a family of G, a jeepney driver who had they, their family lost their home because of the pandemic. And it broke my heart. He and his three children and his wife were living in their jeepney. And I said, you know, we have to end the pandemic as fast as possible for this family and for all our Kababayans who are the poorest of the poor, beloved of the Lord. Um, 
And so this is one way that it's one way that I can do to help contribute to the to the con- whole country effort uh, because we're going to do this every year. So hopefully this will be available for next year and we will have our own vaccine for the Philippines next year. So we do not have to worry about supply chain shortages in the rest of the world. And because this would be cheap, uh, basically every New Year's Day, every Filipino just takes their vaccine pill. You know what I mean? Um, And then maybe every six months you take your pill just to keep the immune system going. Who knows? This is my hope. This is my dream. This is, we, now we see what the Lord has to say. Uh, sometimes when you tell him your dreams, he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> yeah, that's his job. But we'll continue to pray, of course, Father, for the success of this. Because honestly, I, I think that's really something that um, will be really important for the Philippines considering our geographic, our different problems when it comes to social economic differences across the different islands. No, um, maybe I guess. Let me, I, let me yes, ask. Let me ask your listener. So, um, yesterday when I was teaching my class at USD on Zoom, someone asked me about what name will you give the vaccine if it's, and I, I, I had not thought about that. The, our project is called Project Pagasa. Now, you know, someone said Dominivax because I'm a Dominican, right? <laughs> but I'm going to ask anyone who listens, if you have a name, a, per, a name that you, I, especially Filipino, right? This is a Filipino vaccine for the Philippines. If you have a good name, just send it to me on Facebook. You can, um, you know, whatever name, Pinoy Vax. I don't know what name, but there are how many people, the Filipinos are very creative people. So, uh, you know, if there is a name that you think would be um, very representative of a vaccine that is developed in the Philippines by a Filipino for Filipinos, I'd love to hear the name. Oh, that's great. So there's an open call from Father to, to, the, to, to get names out of, of our very uniquely Filipino vaccine. No? Um, so let's continue to pray for Father for that. Um, Maybe, Father, before we, we end, uh, we can just go through some other quick questions on, on side effects and, and maybe some preconditions. For pregnant women, um, are, are they, should they also get themselves vaccinated or, yeah? So, the, I believe the data for that has just been released in the United States that has been, that it is safe for uh, pregnant women, but I'm not sure if that has been published or peer-reviewed yet. I've just seen reports on the news that suggests that it is safe. I know that there have been children, babies who have been vo- born with antibodies against COVID-19 because their par- their mother was vaccinated while she was carrying them. So that has already happened. All right, that's uh, so, okay, that's, that's, that's a good development. Um, when, again, when it comes to allergies and asthma, Father, is that something that's gonna be a concern in taking vaccines? So asthma, I think, is actually a comorbidity that uh, puts you up in the priority list. Um, I do not think it is a uh, contraindication. I don't think, I think that all people with asthma, I know people who have asthma here who were vaccinated as well. For allergies, it depends on the allergy. And honestly, that needs to be discussed with your uh, physician because some people who are hyperallergenic, uh, they have to be vaccinated in a hospital with the necessary drugs on hand in case there is a reaction all right like the epipen father no like, like the epipen mentioned. yeah um are all vaccines safe for all um age groups uh or is there like specific vaccines that should be you know given to very specific age groups so yeah. it depends so this is why the fda has to determine the age group range right now having said that right that's why you know different vaccines were tested on different groups and depending upon which group was tested, you have different vaccines. However, we do not expect much difference in the biology of someone who is 60 versus someone who's 59, right? But you're, when, you turn, you're, when you turn 60, nothing suddenly happens to your body that all of a sudden you are a different kind of human being. So we do not expect significantly different responses uh, between the senior citizens and uh, 50 year olds and 60 year olds, which is why I understand why certain uh, regulatory agencies are willing to expand the use of vaccines, especially during a crisis. 
Okay. Um, maybe just again to clarify, is it possible to get an infection, to get COVID because of a vaccine? <laughs> you cannot get COVID from the vaccine, but you can get COVID soon after being vaccinated because it takes six weeks. Uh, for a two dose, it takes six weeks to be fully vaccinated. It's called a breakthrough infection. All right. If you were positive before, um, mild or severe, and then you recover, should you still get vaccinated or should you just trust your natural immune system to protect you? So the efficacy for a natural infection is 83%. So it's equi- there are some vaccines that are higher, right? So some vaccines are about the same. So AstraZeneca uh, is about the same as a natural infection. So what, what is being done here is that they are, you are, if there is a shortage, you are told to wait because you already have uh, protection. But when your turn comes, you should be vaccinated. You should know that for someone who tested COVID positive before, the first dose acts like a second dose, okay. because, right? So you will get sicker after the first dose yeah. than be after the second dose. All right. I think that 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 covers no uh, most of the things that uh, we were trying to get to. Um, I'll just read some comments, Father. Uh, some people here. Are, there's a lot of thank you and really gratitude for for very clear presentation, very concise, uh, very clear articulations and answering the very different questions. No, um, so yeah, many people are thankful and hopeful actually that more more people will be able to listen to you. No. Um, Actually, our appeal in CEAP is that, well, you can share the video after this to your different, uh, to your relatives, etc. if they have clarifications. And I guess it's really an important thing to share this to your family. You know, honestly, I think the disinformation is, is scaring through the families, no? like the group chats and all. And maybe we need to put more effort um, into that. Um, maybe, Father, you have some um, closing words of encouragement for everyone here who's listening to us no? to to push us, I guess, to, to acting on ourselves. Yeah. Well, I, I will have to end as a priest, you know. <laughs> uh, this is Easter, and it's been a very long Lent. And sometimes even this Lent still feels like Lent. But our target, our target, if this vaccination campaign uh, is successful, is to have a near as normal Pasco as possible this December. Right. So our target is to celebrate the Lord's birth this year with all of the family gatherings and the singing and the laughing that Filipinos are known for, because we could not have that last year. The only way we can do that is if we get vaccinated. And so our hope and our prayer, we must pray first in thank the gratitude to God for our frontliners who are taking enormous risk to help us and to protect us against further illness. Um, But we are called to contribute to that one nation effort, one country effort to end the pandemic. And the way we do that is by getting vaccinated. Is it scary? Yes. It is scary because there are things we don't know. But love is stronger than fear. And so we must, we get injected for love of our family. I remember when the second dose entered my arm, I said, ah, my mom is safe. Because my mom is 80 years old, so she's a senior citizen. And I worry about carrying the virus to her. So now I do not have to worry, right? So so we do this, We we are vaccinated, not for ourselves, but for the people we love. And so love conquers fear. And so we have to do that for each other. And especially for our lolos and our lolas who have not been able to leave their homes for one year. And we have to allow them to come out. And for them to allow them to come out, we must be safe because they have to come out into a safe world. And a world that is safe is where all of us are vaccinated, where we have herd immunity. And of course, at the end of the day, we must ask Mama Mary to pray for us. Um, what else can I say? We have a powerful mother. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Father. Uh, it's really been an enlightening uh, 
Um, on webinar, I, I learned a lot. My notes are full. <laughs> and, and maybe just before I end, I'll also give some synthesis points. But again, I'll just like to remind the audience as well, the offer to name the Filipino vaccine <laughs> made of this is open. No? So please drop, me, uh, drop a message to Father if you actually do have some suggestions. Um, maybe I guess as, as, I, as we end this webinar, I just want to highlight two main points that I, that I saw might be interesting for the audience as well to hear. I guess the first one is is it's really an issue of of discernment on risks and benefits, right? Like, and I think it's beautiful how you mentioned it, Father, that it is scary, it is risky. There are risks to many actions that we do, but I think the important aspect for it is discerning, really. You know, um, how far will my love go? No, for for my family, for the people around me, for the community. No, and and I guess let's the invitation for the audience is let's enter into this kind of process, right? Even to reflect upon our own fears, right? And and maybe we need to do and find the right information as well to clarify fears, um, the things that we need to understand, consult our doctors regarding our own comorbidities, allergies, and whatnot. I guess the second point, and I think this is a very powerful point that you're putting, is how to create the safe world, right? And it always goes back, I guess, as Catholic, um, as, as, as Catholics, no, we go back to the idea of the common good, no? Um, in a sense, taking a risk to a certain extent, also for the protection of the common good, no, for the greater community to build the safe world for relatives. Because I, I kind of just remembered, you no, know, one of the things that, even though my parents were telling me to visit my grandparents in the province, I think one of my struggles was, what if I'm a carrier from NCR, right? And and that was a very valid problem that prevented me from actually moving and meeting my loved ones. And and I think that's that's something that. Um, I hope we get vaccinated as many of us get vaccinated soon to build that safe world. No? Uh, and as you mentioned, Father, love is stronger than fear and love will conquer fear at the end of the day. So thank you so much, Father. Um, thank you again for the kind invitation to, to, to give the webinar today. Yeah, and, um, virtual palakpak, of course, for our amazing speaker today. I'm sure many of us learned today a lot of things, now, all the way from the USA to share us his knowledge and wisdom and, of course, his love for the country. Um, I, at the end of this webinar, uh, the audience that are listening will be flashing on some questions. No? So there will be three questions that you can reflect on, take some time. There will be reflection music. Uh, courtesy of the Jesuit, mu Jesuit Music Ministry of the Jesuit Communications Foundation. So we'll spend about 10 minutes to just reflect on, on, on these final questions. But I guess before we officially end, we'd like to thank Tech Factors, our web host, for being our wonderful partner for this webinar. Again, to everyone, join us again next week. This is only the beginning of our um, information campaign on, on the COVID vaccinations. Next week, Wednesday, from April, on April 21, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, we will have our second webinar. No? And in this second webinar, we will be hearing testimonies of people who've received their vaccine, what did they go through, so that they actually know, you'll actually see you know, what happened with people. No? Um, and then, again, on behalf of our president, Sister Marisa Viri, RVM, and the SEAP Board of Trustees, Mr. Jose Alan Arellano, our executive director, and of course, uh, for the national and the rest of the national secretariat. Again, we'd like you to thank you, Father. We'd like to thank everyone in the audience for jo joining us. This is Miguel Carlo Badine saying thank you and good morning to everyone.
sa i 